kicking off. So, yeah, thanks very much for making yourselves available to attend. And it's fantastic that Richard is available to support us again. Um, I'll just share with you uh, what we're wanting to go through uh, today. And then I'll ask Richard to um, give his presentation so that uh, we get into some good stuff first up. So today we're just I'm just going to uh, run through the Extension Oz Contributor Agreement and I'll pop some links up in the chat. So hopefully you can see those. If you can't, I'll pop them in again. Um, I'll just talk about the uh, progress survey. So I was just wanting to get some indication from you guys about how you feel that this program is um, progressing. And if you'd like to give me some feedback and, and then we can make some plans for the next um, sort of nine months of delivery. Um, I want to cover off on the extension of bootcamp, which is coming up in November. And if you've got any queries about that, um, and just a reminder that I've got all the uh, presentations that we've had to date in one place there um, on a YouTube channel. And we can have a bit of a chat about future workshops and, and meeting planning um, going forward. And considering that you guys are in a position where you can get together, um, you know, maybe there's an opportunity where, you know, between Richard and I, we might be able to do some organising and um, get you guys together and keep the ball rolling with you you guys being connected if if that's something that you'd like to do and if um yeah Richard's available to support as well so just have a bit of a think about that and um so they're the, they're the few things that I want to talk about today and if you guys have got anything that you guys would like to talk about then please make a note of it um and we'll be sure to cover it um while we're together today so I'll um that's just giving a bit of a, a a snapshot of, of what we plan to get through today. And like I said, I've asked Richard um, to give a presentation on hydrophobic soils, because I know that there is some interest uh, in the group. Um, so this is a bit of an introduction um, and some resources for, for you kicking off. So um, thanks, Richard. I'll pass it over to you. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I'll just get that up. Yep. Here we go. Sharing now, so that should yep. be coming up. That looks good. If you could just make it like a presentation if possible. Mm. And you see all that? Yep. Great. Um, so first I need to acknowledge that uh, Simon Yep prepared the slides. Simon works with me on a soil CRC project. This is the Sandy Soils project. And um, we recently got him to give a lecture to our third year crop and pasture science students uh, on this topic. So these were the slides that he prepared. So um, I've shamelessly stolen them for today. And of course, the photograph there at the center really shows water repellents in its finest, uh, where you've got a, a sandy material and the water beading up and just sitting on top of it with showing no inclination whatsoever to soak into the soil. Various terms are used, water repellents, hydrophobic, non-wetting, uh, they're referring to the same thing. And this is a phenomenon that occurs all over the world, uh, a whole range of climates, uh, soil types and land use types. In Western Australia, something like 10 million hectares, uh, almost 40% of the ag area uh, expresses water repellents to some extent. And you can see on the map on the right, this is a deeperd product, uh, which just shows the, the abundance of water repellents by region. So virtually every region has some soils with water repellents. Uh, where it's colored yellow, it just means that a less than a third of the landscape would be affected. When it's getting into the pink colors, it's 50%. Uh, and uh, the um, 
more purpley colour. Um, more than 70% of the landscape is at risk of water repellents. But of course, it doesn't occur every year or to the same extent every year. It's, it's still a bit of a mysterious phenomenon, water repellents, uh, being able to uh, predict exactly where it's going to occur in a particular year and how severe it's going to be. Uh, but in general, there are estimates of 30 to 40% loss in crop and pasture production when it's at its worst. And that um, if you aggregate all of those potential losses, it's uh, two to 300 million per year. So something that uh, has obviously been the focus of attention in the West and uh, increasingly in South Australia for quite some time. The reason it's problematic is mostly the effect on soil hydrology. So you just get fields like the one on the right hand side. It's uh, rained quite heavily. You can see the standing water on the surface, but if you take a spade and uh, uh, dig into it, apart from a few centimetres at the surface uh, that have wet up, it's bone dry underneath. And, um, and that uh, uh, lack of infiltration uh, can persist for hours, even days, even months. Um, and so um, the lack of infiltration is obviously a major problem, but on sloping land, that excess water that's sitting on the surface may cause overland flow and erosion risk. And then if you dig into the profile, you do find on water repellent soils, it does infiltrate to some extent, um, but it's often through what's called finger flow. Uh, that is, you don't get complete wetting, but um, uh, there will be uh, zones of soil that wet up. And it's shown here on the photograph where uh, a water repellent sand has had water uh, added to the surface, uh, mixed with a blue dye. Um, and then after some uh, hours or days, you dig a pit and just look at where the dye has moved into the soil as an indication of how it's wet up. And so here you can see those finger flows, but there are large areas of the uh, upper soil that just didn't wet up at all, stayed uh, completely dry. And something else you often see with that finger flow is, particularly if there's a clay subsoil, uh, water will flow down one of those uh, channels until it hits that clay layer and then it will tend to spread out. And uh, so you often get wetting of uh, water repellent soils, duplex soils, from the bottom up. Um, so as the, the rainy season proceeds and you get more water accumulating above the clay layer, it starts to wick up and uh, moisten that topsoil. Uh, the channels where the water flows are often associated with old root channels, and I'll come back to that later. Richard, um, can you get water logging in that you know, like you're saying, it can a pool in the in the clay layers. Can you end up with sort of deep waterlogging in in those instances? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can. I mean, waterlogging is a, a risk in duplex soils anyway. Um, I guess it just depends on how much of the water in finger flow um, accounts for all of the rain that falls, and how much is still sitting on the surface. So if some of the water is still sitting on the surface and evaporates back into the atmosphere, then overall that probably reduces the water logging risk, but that water that passes down the channels and uh, then hits the top of the bee horizon and sits there, yes, that's going to contribute to water logging. So, but I, I don't think it exacerbates water logging um, uh, worse than you would get if there was no water repellents. Yeah, I, I think that was your question, wasn't it? Anyway, um, 
the consequences, I'm sure many of you have seen this patchy delayed germination. Um, so you get reduced plant density. Um, and um, obviously that reduces the overall growth, uh, nutritional status and final yield of the crop. Here's some um, drone images that were taken by Stan Sahaki. Um, I think this one's down north of Kojanup on uh, water repellent gravels. And you can see on the left, uh, large bare patches of a canola crop. Um, and on the right, um, just very patchy germination in every row. There's some plants that came up and others that didn't. Uh, sometime later in the season, the canola, as we know, has great capacity for compensatory growth. So even if you get problems early in the season, it often does uh, fill in, uh, whereas the cereals don't have quite the same capacity to uh, fill in the gaps and you still left throughout the season with uh, those bare patches. The origin of water repellents is organic compounds uh, that are hydrophobic, that is they're water repelling compounds and they can come from the waxes uh, eroded from plant leaves. They can come from decomposing organic matter in the soil. They can come from root exudates. They can come from fungal hyphae and their exudates. Um, and, um, but broadly organic matter in the soil can be, or the input of organic matter can be divided into two main groups of compounds. There are what we call non-polar compounds and polar compounds. And the non-polar compounds are carbon molecules that are uncharged, um, whereas the polar molecules have a charged functional group on them, which enables them to react with um, soil particles. Um, not all of the organic matter in soil is contributing to water repellents. It's generally only a small proportion. And from the chemistry that's been done, you end up with a group of so-called fatty acids and related compounds that are made up of about a chain of 16 to 36 carbon um, atoms all bonded together to create this uh, molecule. Uh, these are the ones that seem to be most powerful in, in terms of causing water repellents. But there's also some evidence that particles of undecomposed organic matter just sitting in the soil in pores may also contribute to the water repellents. And to understand water repellents, Simon prepared this nice diagram here which talks about surface tension and water repellents. So I don't know how much chemistry you've done, but um, th this is um, just trying to break it down into the, the key processes. So if you've got a water drop and it could be sitting on a, um, any hydrophobic surface, it will tend to bead up. And in that water, um, droplet or bead, you've got lots of water molecules and those water molecules are all at, um, weakly bonded to one another. Um, and inside the water drop, all of those bonds and forces are balanced. And that's what gives the water drop almost a spherical appearance or a spherical shape. Then you've got the water molecules that are right on the outer surface of that droplet. Uh, the molecular forces on them from one water molecule to another are not completely balanced. Um, and that leads to what we call surface tension. And it's like a skin that forms on the surface of that water drop. And that skin helps to give the water drop its um, spherical shape. Now, if you put that water droplet onto a, um, a different surface, a hydrophilic surface, 
the water molecules now bond to the surface and it flattens that water droplet out and spreads it out. Um, and so in the soil, you've got some surfaces such as surfaces of clays, which are very hydrophilic and have very high surface energy and they bond to the water, they spread the water out and they allow the water to infiltrate and move. Um, but you also have some surfaces in soils, um, water repellent soils that are hydrophobic. They have very little capacity to attract water molecules and so the water molecules just sit on the surface. And of course, when we add wetting agents to uh, soils, our aim is to shift to the left so that the surface tension is reduced and the water is then able to spread out and uh, be absorbed into the soil. But anyone who's worked with uh, water repellent soils knows that it's not stable, it keeps changing. Uh, even during the season and from year to year. And this diagram here just uh, tries to explain why that might be happening. So on the left hand side, we've got a, a dry soil um, and um, a hydrophobic um, organic matter on the surface of the soil. So when the water droplets sits on the soil, it beads up. And that's because the organic matter on the surface of the clays and sand is organized in such a way that mostly it's the non-polar parts of the molecule that are sticking out and don't attract the water. At the other extreme, and this can happen in water repellent soils after they wet up, those molecules rearrange themselves and the, uh, the polar ends of the molecules are now more exposed. And so the water droplets are attracted to those, the surface tension breaks down and the water spreads evenly and soaks into the soil. Um, so something can happen as the soils wet and as they dry out that causes rearrangement of these um, uh, hydrophobic molecules to make them more or less uh, repellent to water. And so that's our best understanding of why water repellents is most severe in the summer um, and the break of the season. But uh, during winter and spring after you've had persistent repeated rainfall and wetting up of the soil, that water repellent behavior disappears. When we measure water repellents, um, we can either measure the actual repellents in the field, or we can take the sample and bring it back to the lab, um, oven dry it, uh, and then we measure water repellents, but that's really a potential water repellents. And there are various ways to do that. Um, the sophisticated lab way of measuring it is to actually measure the angle on these water drops uh, using um, you know, sophisticated cameras and laboratory setup. But that's um, not very useful to most of us. Um, what's most useful is to be able to measure it in the field. And of course, the water droplet penetration time test um, is the most commonly one that people use. So you just uh, scrape away a little bit of the surface soil and uh, you add some droplets and uh, measure how long it takes for those uh, droplets to uh, infiltrate. The downside of that technique is that, you know, it, those water droplets uh, might stay on the surface for hours and um, most of us don't have time to just sit around for hours watching water droplets. Um, the other thing I would point out with this is that the water repellents is often greatest 
a few millimeters below the soil surface. So it's often better to scrape away a few millimeters uh, of the surface soil before doing that test. Um, the other way is what's called the MED or molarity of ethanol droplet test. So you make up um, ethanol solutions of different concentration. Um, and so you start with water and see if it penetrates in less than 10 seconds. If it doesn't, then you try one molar ethanol. Uh, repeat, if it still doesn't soak in within 10 seconds, you go to two molar and so on, until you find the molarity of ethanol, which allows the droplet to soak in within 10 seconds. And uh, that's the value that you give to water repellents. And we find in most water repellent soils, the value will come out between about uh, one and a half and uh, three and a half or four. We know that water repellents is related to carbon, but there's no um, simple relationship between soil organic carbon and measurements of water repellents. Um, here's a, a bunch of different studies in different parts of the world. And some of them you can see there's a, not a bad relationship. Um, the bottom left hand one is from a, a large number of studies done in Western Australia by Richard Harper. I think this was down in the um, uh, Jiramungup area uh, where they found no relationship there between water repellents and organic carbon. And the reason for that, sorry, the reason for that is that it's not all of the organic matter that's causing water repellents. It's just a portion of the organic matter. And obviously it's related to the outermost layer of organic matter and the balance of these polar and non-polar compounds. It's most commonly a problem where the clay content is less than 5%. But studies suggest that only a few percent of the sand grains need to be coated with water repelling organic matter to stop um, um, easy infiltration of water. And that's um, represented in this diagram on the right hand side where the closed circles, the dark circles, uh, are supposed to represent sand grains that are coated with uh, water repellent organic matter. And just a few percent of that is enough to stop or to uh, alter the rate at which water will infiltrate and move into the soil. You can get water repellents in uh, clay soils, but um, um, most commonly it's in the sandy soils. Uh, microbial activity in the soil can have both positive and negative effects. So fairy rings, um, the outer edge of those um, associated with the fungal hypha are often water repellent. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are wax degrading bacteria and actinomycetes that can decompose the uh, hydrophobic compounds. And Margaret Roper from CSIRO showed that in the lab, she could culture those organisms and introduce them to hydrophobic soils and reduce the water repellents. Um, but uh, we haven't been able to translate that into a field um, amelioration or field inoculation test as yet. Uh, there's some suggestion from Margaret's work that liming um, increases the activity of these wax degrading bacteria and that helps to uh, ameliorate water repellents to some extent. Farming systems practices um, have an influence on uh, the expression of water repellents. Uh, dry sowing, um, there's pretty good evidence that that increases the, uh, um, the likelihood of water repellents affecting crop emergence. So this photograph here on the right hand side from a GRDC publication shows the difference between a 
dry sown part of the field and a wet sown part of the field in terms of overall emergence. Now there is a big shift towards dry sowing, about a third of grain crops in Western Australia now are dry sown. Um, and also with climate change, we're getting uh, weaker um, early season breaks. And so these are exacerbating the problems with uh, water repellents. And with the dry sowing, it may be related also to tighter packing of the uh, soil particles after dry sowing compared to wet sowing. It may be related to um, more of the seed being coated or surrounded by repellent soil when you do dry sowing. And that could come from backfilling uh, behind knife points of water repellent soil around the seed to a greater extent than if the soil is moist. Over 30 years of uh, research, various technologies have been evolved and developed to uh, reduce the, the damage from water repellents. Um, and we can broadly divide them into amelioration, which is changing the soil properties to remove repellents, mitigation, which is to reduce the symptoms, but not the underlying cause. And a third approach is uh, avoidance. And on some farms, that's the approach that uh, farmers have uh, adopted. They've simply changed to a different land use, such as perennials, uh, which don't suffer from the same problem with water repellents. So just going through some of those uh, management techniques. For amelioration, there's deep soil um, cultivation. So mixing, inversion, it's either diluting the repellent's topsoil or burying it. And those soil uh, cultivation treatments are often useful for other purposes. So they might be combined with alleviating compaction. Um, they might be primarily to bury herbicide resistant weeds, um, or they might be to uh, help incorporate uh, lime uh, at the same time. So there's certainly a lot of uh, deep soil cultivation happening in the West as a uh, uh, treatment of multiple constraints, including the water repellents. Uh, clay addition is another. So this is trying to enrich the surface soil with clay um, to try and bring the clay content up to about 6%. Um, so it's particularly for those really poor sands that have only a few percent clay in them. Where does the clay come from? Well, if the clays increase in the profile within the upper 30 or 40 centimetres, uh, the spading, inversion, tillage or deep ripping will bring some clay up, which can be mixed in the topsoil. Um, if the clay is consistently at about 30 to 60 centimetres, then delving is another way to bring the clay up. And um, otherwise, uh, excavating a pit, uh, removing the clay rich subsoil, spreading it and then incorporating it is a, a final way to do that. We estimate that in WA probably 100,000 hectares of land has been treated with uh, clay spreading and I haven't seen recent stats on uh, the areas that have been uh, uh, deep tilled or moldboard ploughed but um, um, it's now quite a large area. And it all uses large machinery. Here's some photographs we took at the Wantfa field day at uh, Bolgart uh, a few months back. These are different types of delvers. So they aim to get down to 60, 70, 80 centimetres, and they're designed to try and um, rip into clay and then drag that clay up 
so that it's closer to the surface and uh, then can be mixed in the surface. There's also spaders. Um, the, the name, I guess, comes from the fact that it looks like there's a whole series of spades that are attached to a, um, a rotating um, uh, cylinder and uh, they basically just dig down and lift soil material up. They'll go down to 30 or 40 centimetres. Then there's the inversion ploughs, uh, modified one way or moldboard ploughs. Uh, the claying operation. So on the right hand side, this is from down um, at Esperance. Um, in a uh, paddock where the clay is metre and a half, two metres deep, they simply open up a pit, uh, use scrapers to dig out the clay and then spread it in a two, 300 metre radius around the pit. Uh, and then use spaders and other means to mix it and incorporate it. And uh, if the paddock is very large, then they'll open up a series of different pits in order to treat the whole paddock. Uh, with any treatment like this, there are positives, but there are also risks. So if you're bringing up subsoil, uh, the question is, is it benign or does it have hostile properties such as high pH, low pH, salinity, sodicity, um, aluminium toxicity, boron toxicity. Um, with the clay, particularly cut clay spreading, there's now a lot of experience that shows that if you leave it at the surface or close to the surface, um, you may actually make the situation worse because it can result in surface sealing or crusting and hard setting. And that clay sitting on top of a sand means that if you get uh, light rainfalls, the depth of the wetting is very shallow and most of that water is lost by evaporation. Um, and, but you can test the clay um, to see uh, what its properties are. Probably the main one is to test how much clay is in it. Uh, David Hall did a survey of pits where farmers had excavated clay to mix into sands. And some of the subsoils have up to 70% clay, so they're highly effective. Some of the pits, the, the subsoil only had 10% clay in it. So that was fairly useless. Um, uh, most of the uh, pits that um, he tested would have had in the order of 30 to 40% clay. And some of the clays contain reasonably high levels of potassium and sulfur in them, which have a significant nutritional benefit from the claying as well. With mitigation, so this is uh, trying to alleviate the symptoms in a particular year. Uh, wetting agents are the number one practice. Photograph on the right shows on a forest gravel down in the uh, Great Southern, uh, treated with wetting agent on the left and not on the right. And you can see quite a substantial difference in uh, emergence. So the wetting agents are surfactants or like detergents that break down the surface tension to enable the, uh, the rainfall to spread out and then infiltrate into the soil. Although I was at a, the one for field day and the Sakoa people were talking about their products and it sounds to me like they also have some water absorbing polymers in them so they're not just breaking down surface tension, that some of the new products are actually water absorbing compounds uh, to try and um, uh, increase the infiltration and availability of water, particularly around the seed. With the wetting agents, uh, the early work used blanket application and produced highly variable and unreliable responses. Uh, the current approach partly for cost, is to band the wetting agent 
just close to the seed. And so far the research suggests that on the forest gravels, this is a pretty reliable technology, works 90% um, of the time, but it's not a reliable technology on deep sands and the reasons are still not entirely clear. Uh, Steve Davies at um, Deeper Geraldton is the, the expert on all of that. Uh, other approaches, um, no till, particularly if you've got uh, disc openers. Um, this can be a way of preserving old root channels or biopores. Um, and these biopores, the channels where the roots went last year, if you can keep them open, they do seem to allow um, a deeper and more effective water um, penetration, even on highly repellent soils. So Margaret Roper and colleagues at CSIRO did some uh, really convincing work on that. And the photographs here just show um, examples of that. So start of the season, uh, on the right, the soil had been cultivated and the stubble burnt. And you can see when they watered that with the dye in the water, there's almost zero penetration. But in the no-till soil, um, you can see that there is penetration uh, of the blue dye um, and it's corresponding with where the previous year's crop went. And if you look more closely, you can see most of that water movement is in the old, old root channels. And so the photographs on the bottom just show later in the season, um, even after the crop has emerged, you can see infiltration in the old root channels as well as in the new root channels. Uh, all of this work was done with disc seeders. Um, and the disc seeder, of course, causes less soil disturbance and preserves the biopores much better. Um, um, sorry for interrupting, Richard. I find that, that last slide very interesting because we are talking about organic matter before and it perhaps possibly being an issue, but it's... Um, heartening, I guess, to see that even in that stubble retention um, paddock, that it was still assisting with uh, water infiltration. Yeah, um, yeah. And not, and not yep. necessarily. Yep, yep. I don't know what proportion of farmers would have disc openers. Um, my guess is it's probably less than 20% because they are more expensive. Um, and so not everyone's able to uh, tap into that technology. Nevertheless, there is with um, GPS guided steering, there's also um, plenty of field evidence that um, even with knife points, if you sow close to the row of the previous crop, then um, some of the water entry through the old root channels is still preserved and effective. And this photograph here, again, it's on a forest gravel from the Great Southern region, showing the difference between um, part of the field where they were able to sow almost on the row compared to off the row, affecting the success of canola emergence. Um, another mitigation approach is what's called furrow sowing. So you try to um, uh, create reasonably significant furrows which allow water harvesting um, into the zone of soil around where the seed is sown and the fertilizer is placed. But the, the soil in the interrow on the ridges may remain fairly dry um, even for weeks and months uh, into the season. But uh, with this furrow sowing, the water harvesting uh, enables you to get um, more even um, and faster germination. There are some issues there with nutrition and uh, with herbicides and uh, pathogens. So um, um, the local knowledge will probably tell you just uh, what's the best way to uh, create that sort of furrow sowing and whether it's going to be effective in your particular area. But uh, Simon Yep, in his PhD research showed that uh, with this type of furrow sowing, 
the water harvesting effect, so long as you can get good germination, um, it places water and nutrients just right where the seed needs and you can get a, a real boost in early crop vigor, um, even compared to using um, uh, blanket wetting agents. Uh, the way of doing this water harvesting is with uh, uh, modifying knife points um, um, or, or the boots, particularly if they've got a wing on them. Uh, that wing helps to throw the water repellent soil onto the ridge so that in the furrow, um, the soil um, is uh, water absorbing and therefore can capture the benefit of the, uh, the water harvesting. Uh, paired road see seeding is a sort of a variation on that. Uh, the press wheels are useful because they help to stabilize the furrow to maximize the water harvesting. And now a lot of farmers are putting a banding agent um, uh, in, in the sowing row uh, behind the, um, um, the press wheel as a way of uh, trying to get that, the beneficial effect of the, uh, the banded wetting agent as well as reducing the cost of uh, the amount of wetting agent needed. So there's pretty good experimental evidence. Um, here's from uh, some pretty sandy soils, uh, Bajangara and at Bala, showing the benefits from the, the winged points in terms of plant establishment. Um, the photograph on the right, I think is a, a fairly persuasive case that if you can get that right, there's uh, big benefits from that, uh, um, the water harvesting effect of uh, the winged boots. And here's some more photographs from GRDC publications, again, showing big boost in plant density and uh, evenness of the, the crop. However, um, it's not a foolproof technology and um, I was involved in some work down at Esperance that uh, David Hall of Deepherd uh, ran experiments uh, down there where the, uh, the winged boots really had no significant effect over five successive years on a, a sandy water repellent soil. So it's not a foolproof technology, but there's certainly people making it work out there. So just to wrap up, because this wasn't meant to be a long presentation, uh, water repellents has been and remains a significant constraint to crop and pasture production. We expect with the changes in climate that we're getting, it's likely to be a, a more severe problem in future. Uh, over time, various amelioration and mitigation strategies have been developed and uh, with varying degrees of effectiveness. Um, and some of them are more universally effective than others. Um, some are, are more specific to particular locations and soil types. And uh, a lot of this learning has come through collaborative research led by DPIRD, uh, Steve Davies and his team with contributions from other people, including our work at Murdoch and CSIRO. So that's all I wanted to share, but Felicity, you've got the PowerPoint file and there's a, a few references listed there. So if anyone would like to do a bit more reading, uh, those are some suggested places to look. So happy to, um, um, answer questions or uh, take part in further discussion on that, but that's just the, if you like, the, the basics of what um, we understand about water repellents. Thanks, thanks Richard. Um, there aren't any questions in the chat, but feel free to unmute yourselves and or turn on your videos and, um, and ask Richard some questions. I've written down a couple, so perhaps why well, I don't want to take the thunder of other people, but perhaps while they're getting themselves organised to unmute and turn their videos on. 
Um, just in regards to testing, Richard, does are there any? Is it worthwhile sending to labs to do? Are there any labs doing water repellency tests, or is it are the infield tests sort of the best bet? CSBP will do a test, um, but look, I, I think it's uh, you can do it in the field. Um, and, and most people are aware of their water repellents and uh, which areas. Uh, probably the main thing I would suggest is uh, that just scrape a few millimetres of soil off the surface uh, because the water repellents is often uh, greatest in that sort of uh, two to 10 millimetre below the surface zone. Um, but I guess um, with the uh, doing the water repellents test, um, probably a good idea to make sure you've got good quality water, mm, okay. so that it's you know it's not brackish, salty, or um, inadvertently has some detergent or anything else mixed in it, or um, um, clay or muddy water. All, all of those things could uh, give you a um, uh, incorrect result, but. Uh, look, there's a lot of soil testing which you can't do in real time in the field and you have to pay for it. But this is one where you can do it yourself by observation. So uh, why not take advantage of free soil testing? Um, I, I, and I guess as more and more people have access to drones, it just probably gives them a the ability to uh, look at a whole paddock um, and uh, see the distribution. Whereas I guess we all tend to um, uh, drive into a paddock, um, park near the gate and then uh, walk a few meters into the paddock and uh, do our soil testing and assessment there. And uh, um, it'd be better to have a look over the whole field to uh, uh, get a, a clearer sense of where the real problems are and also how persistent they are from year to year. Yeah, good. Thanks. Uh, Peter, did you have a, a question? Or you just... Uh, yeah, no, not really. Um... So Peter, you've probably got more experience with pastures and water repellents than I do. So be interested in your comments there about uh, how common, how severe and uh, what's, what people are doing in the pasture setting. Yeah, um, I think we've definitely got water repellent soils, um, but yeah, it probably doesn't have as much impact on germination. Um, although having said that, you know, I mean, the pastures are infested with capeweed. So, you know, maybe it is a case of, um, you know, areas not really establishing and the weeds getting in there because every pasture is, you know, full of cape weed. So yeah, that, that could be a, a bad outcome of it. Um, yeah, we found that we were, we tested soils and, you know, I think a lot of it was water repellent and, um, but yeah, nobody was really doing a lot. Uh, there was one bloke was using um, the Lua H2O um, and he was seeing effects and we gave it a bit of a test and we didn't really see much of an impact, but that was on one soil type, which I think had a lot of other constraints. So, yeah, yeah, no, I probably can't. Yeah, I guess with pastures, you always have the benefit of those biopores, the old root channels from previous years. And so, um, yeah, the Cape weed's an interesting one because, you know, what's cause and what's effect. Uh, obviously, a Cape weed with its big tap root probably has a leaves a, a very effective biopore. Um, which allows uh, soaking and infiltration and probably gives the next generation of Cape weed a, a head start in terms of getting established in that area, uh, wetting up and uh, getting away before other pasture species get away. Yeah. And I know um, a seed producer down here um, has found chicory to be quite useful. I'm not sure if it was water repellent or what, but where he had areas of, um, I think, from memory, you know, it was um, surface water um, and growing chicory in those areas. He said it just all drained away and that's his, that's his sort of, he doesn't really like perennial pastures, but that's his favourite perennial pasture just because of the, whether it's compaction as well, you know, it might have a few different effects, but 
yeah, yeah similar similar with the taproot, I suppose. Yeah, and I guess it is the case that um, we tend to have multiple soil constraints, and so where you've got water repellents, there are other things as well. So uh, it's not just a matter of targeting the water repellents. Mm. Um, we've had a few pasture trials this year that we've done on water repellent soils as well. So we had one of our pasture trials that we mold watered an area and sowed new pastures where they were cereal pastures or legume pastures as well. And you could definitely see the difference between an area that wasn't mold watered compared to an area that was mold watered. Um, and we also have started looking at doing mold boarding or plaza ploughing prior to sowing perennials because the impact on the perennials is actually quite large with a non-wetting because you'll have perennials growing but they won't actually have an annual in there as well that will grow during the winter period so with the mold boarding or a plaza ploughing you can actually have annuals growing through your perennials and you get the summer use of a perennial and the winter use of an annual in that paddock Yeah, that's that's great, Brianna. And what um, annuals are you are you trying to grow between your perennials? Uh, so between the perennials, there's a lot of cerradella that goes in. We've also started. There's a lot of growers starting to look at sowing a cereal just as a forage during the year. Um, Grant Bain up at Walkaway does a lot of it. He sows cereals and will go through and harvest his cereals between his perennials as well. Yep. Uh, there's a lot more interest in it now because we've got a lot of cattle farmers down here from stations. So we are starting to look at different ways of incorporating annuals like the cereal, cereal forages, uh, clover, cerradellas, more into our perennials as well, instead of just using them as a perennial, but giving them the option of something else. Yeah, great. Okay, that sounds terrific. Um, Nadine, are you there? Do you do you have you had any done any work? I imagine uh, your area might have a few um, non-wetting soils too. Uh, not really so much. No? Okay. Um, where we are, if there is, it's tiny little patches. Um, the soils are mainly loams or clays. Um, there's a bit of sand, but it's not a not a big issue. Um, yeah. Previously, I'd worked with Steve Davies when I was working somewhere else, and um. Yeah, had a look at it, some of that stuff. It's interesting. Yep. Yeah, great. Okay. Now we seem to have lost um, <laughs> Richard. He must have his uh, internet must have cut out on him. So we'll uh, hopefully he'll uh, come back at some stage. But um, I might just uh, keep moving on. So um, I guess I'll just talk quickly about the paired paddock um, project. So I know, Peter, I had a bit of a chat to you about, and you were interested in, in packaging up something about hydrophobic soils. Um, and I think also um, Marnie and Freya were talking about it as well. So um, I guess having had Richard's talk about hydrophobic soils, I'm still happy for, for you to um, go down that road or investigate that and either report back on something that's, um, you know, relevant to your area or um, have a chat to um, Marnie and uh, Freya about what, um, what, what they were thinking of, of presenting in um, that space as well. So um, there might be bits of what Richard has said today that you think, well, that's something I want to investigate and you could go a bit further down down the track. So um, Richard's presented that with some great information about the different um, ways of dealing with, with those soil types um, and maybe we could see some economic returns or you know cost benefit analysis and those sort of things so I think there's still plenty of opportunity to drill a bit deeper if you if you wanted to go down that way. Yeah one of the things that we talked about at that one for field day Richard was um guys were interested to sort of find out well how do I find out you know how do I best test how clay my subsoil is and um you know we talked about just doing the hand test or the field test a bit but um yeah, there is also, I guess it's expensive, but I think it's about a $37 test to do a texture test as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
But again, I think that's something that you could just do in the field. Um, I mean, it does take a bit of practice. I guess, Richard, you'd, you'd agree, you know, you have to sort of do a few different to sort of get the idea that, yes, this one actually feels clearer than mm. this one. So, um, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I dropped out. On a... Yeah, oh, you noticed that? <laughs> Did you get a better offer? <laughs> I guess even just getting them to compare, um, you know, everybody has their own style, but even just doing a topsoil test and then doing a subsoil test, and that should tell you, well, obviously this one's a lot more clay than what the yeah. topsoil is. Yeah, we had some, uh, when we're out at the field day at Bolgert, um, it was at Trevor Symes' place, and Trevor's been a, uh, an innovator in soil um, amelioration and uh, so he's now done quite a bit of delving claying and um, his point was um, tr look first for the clay sources that are at the top of the hill because it's much easier to cart a heavy load of clay down the hill than to try and cart it up the hill um, and Within a farm, the areas that have uh, good clay and available clay probably are going to have similar composition of clay. So it, it's, you probably don't need to do loads and loads of soil tests. Um, if you do uh, one, um, and then if you try and find other areas that are pretty similar to that, um, then you're probably in reasonably good shape in knowing what you're dealing with and that it's um, benign clay and uh, doesn't have any nasties in it. Mm. Yeah. Um, before you dropped out, we were talking about Kate weed and I was thinking uh, when you were talking about the organic matter issues or some of the issues with organic matter or organic carbon, um, are there some plants that uh, can cause more hydrophobic issues than others? Um, and has there been, you know, like sometimes we know a wheat crop grows better after a canola crop or vice versa? Um, you know, has there been that sort of um, farming system work done in regards to um, hydrophobic soils? Um, yes. Um, I decided not to show this uh, slide just in the interest of uh, keeping it short. <laughs> um, but yeah, this um, slide is in at the end of the file. Um, so this is from a um, international publication so it's got a whole range of species that are of little interest to us. But yeah, there's uh, definitely some uh, species that uh, produce, appear to produce more water repellents than others. The eucalypts, of course, are fairly notorious in that regard. Um, but uh, the legumes do appear to um, produce uh, more water repellent compounds in the soil than um, uh, cereals. Um, but this, I think there's local information as well from uh, Deep Herd that would be worth having a look at. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Okay. And um, yeah, so I've popped your that presentation um, onto the Google Drive, which we're using to share um, information. Uh, so I've popped that up there already, but I'll email it out as well, although it's quite a big file. It's a big file, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, yep. so, terrific. All right. Yep. In uh, Just for, for time's sake, we might wrap it up there, but I think we've had a good bit of a discussion and um, you all have got Richard's contacts. So if you'd like some more information or um, I'm sure Richard would be happy to follow up with you um, at any time. So thanks again, Richard. We really appreciate your um, time and, and effort in and your colleagues time mm. and, and sharing that information with us. It's really, really fantastic. And I was just saying when you were off before, but coming back in, that uh, Peter was interested in investigating hydrophobic soils a bit more, and also um, Marnie from the Hemp Growers and Freya from Gilamai. Um, so I've asked the groups to do a bit of a paired project and choose mm -hmm. something they're interested in. And um, yeah, hydrophobic soils sort of came up. So I thought this is a great introduction uh, to that, and they can sort of pick and choose to drill down into some of those um, bits yeah. that you, you've brought up and 
Um, yeah, and I think going to those landholders that are, um, you know, champions of, of managing um, difficult soils is a great idea as well and um, really you know, working in the field and reporting that back. Yeah. yeah, actually, one that just reminds me of one other thing. Um, I've been trying to get around and um, talk to a few people and see a few different things. I was out at Tim Curran last week talking to an agronomist out there about what he thinks works and doesn't work. Exactly. And, it's just, it's um, he just sort of talked to a fair bit of, he sort of thought, you know, resetting the surface and using the plaza plough was beneficial. And there's a grower who's um, used a plaza plough down there, cogent up. So I'd spoken to him as well. But it just reminded me then um, the FACI group had a field day recently looking at the seed coating with the, um, the surfactants, the like Sokoa. Mm. Um, and, yeah, it's, that's a, an interesting topic, which I didn't know too much about, and I tried to learn about it. They ran a trial, didn't see any results really from any of the treatments. Um, but I have heard that it does affect the seed germination. So, um, yeah, whether that's... Uh, a viable alternative or not, I'm not sure. Uh, Jeff Anderson at uh, Deep Herd Northern has been working on that for, I don't know, four or five years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he, he'd be the person who knows most about it. Yeah. And um, I know he has had some years when they didn't get any obvious benefit, and but other years where uh, I remember a trial he had out at Meckering a few years back where they seem to be seeing some positive uh, effects of coating the seeds with um, uh, surfactant and I think also water absorbing polymers. Mm. Yeah. Very good. All right, thanks very much uh, again, Richard. So we'll move on, I guess, in light of, um, uh, and, I, and I guess I, I wanna talk about this um, as, a, as a priority, so I'll bring it up now. But um, since you guys can uh, get together and travel around, I'm um, more than happy to organize something for you guys to do. And I think the last time we met in person, uh, the next um, catch up, we were going to go and try and get to CSBP to go through the soil testing procedure um, and some soil test interpretation. Uh, and possibly, um, if we can fit it all in one day or in a couple of days, um, go through the soil pit um, procedure. So actually, well, I guess, um, learning how to assess a soil pit, but also giving the participants the skills to be able to assess a soil pit with an audience um, in their own regions, uh, if they're wanting to do that. So I guess I just want to get some feedback um, around timing for that. So if I did go and organise something, I know that harvest in some areas has probably already started. Um, and I'm not really sure how long the harvest lasts in WA. I know that the rainfall this year hasn't been so spectacular, um, but I'm just wondering, I guess the southern areas will be later, um, but I'm wondering, will harvest in those southern areas push into December or do you think that most of the harvest might be finished um, by December? And I guess... I'm wondering, uh, I'm also thinking about, yeah, the, the guys who are, are grower groups are probably more um, in that space than, than maybe the NRM organisations, but would, would December be a convenient time, do you think? And I'm happy to send out a, a bit of a thing to everybody to ask them, you know, in regards to timing, but um, for you guys that are here, I guess I'm, I'm happy to receive some immediate feedback. Oh, end of Jan or early Feb, best for me, Nadine says already. Thanks, Nadine. That's good. End of January would probably be best for me as well. We've got harvest and then report writing comes out yep. straight after that and then events. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Well, that's good. Yep. I imagine that, um, you know, I think with the other grower groups that will be a similar um issue and I know as an NRM, NRM organisation there's reporting at the in December that's required for the middle of January which is a really super convenient time. Um, so uh, that might be yeah, a busy time for some of the NRM organisations. So Richard what do you think maybe the end of January early Feb would be 
um, would you be available to support at that time, do you think? Sure. Um, this year or next year? Next year, yeah. Since my passport's been packed away. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Um, how are you managing that? Um, are you still trying to manage projects that are that are um, overseas? Yeah. 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 yeah, just through the Zoom. Yep. Um, yeah, look, I, I think um, where you have existing relationships and partnerships, mm. that can work. Um, yep. And um, but uh, when it comes to developing new projects, it's a little bit more tricky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Great. Okay. Well, perhaps we'll. Um, yeah, I don't want to rush anything through. I just thought I'd ask and see. Um, yeah, how people were feeling about that. So I will flick a, a thing out to everybody and and get some sort of poll happening. Um, but we'll perhaps we'll work towards the end of January, early February, so we're not in any sort of rush. Um, and we can get the best opportunity, you know, to get you all together rather than only having maybe a few of you. So, and who knows, maybe old mate might let us into WA by then. Um, the Murdoch has a farm about uh, 45 minutes uh, south of Perth at uh, Mundajong. And we've got a open pit there, um, which we use have used uh, for students and uh, uh, various um, other Soil Science Australia activities, looking at how do you describe a soil profile. Yep. Um, and there's lots of sand around there that's water repellent as well. Mm -hmm. So if people wanted to come to a central place, mm. um, then I think that's available. Yep. Um, Great. But um, if, if it was better to do a few regional um, locations because I think with a lot of the confidence in describing the soil profile um, it's obviously better if you developed your skill and confidence in the soils that are local to your region mm. so it could be either way yep yeah yep yeah, yep yeah, for sure so we could um, yeah all right well we'll perhaps have a chat about that Richard and um, and uh, come up because I had thought the last time you know if we if I came over it we'd do a good two days um, make it worthwhile people coming in and do CSBP and then yeah have an opportunity to to drive out and um, see mm. the stuff happening in the regions that aren't mm. too far away but mm. um, yeah, okay. and of course, at that time of year, um, uh, wouldn't be much fun trying to um, excavate some of our hard setting mm. uh, loam and clay soils. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll we'll um, there. So there could be some opportunities to to do some perhaps um, like you say the sandy soils or the ones close to Perth this time, and if we get another opportunity to catch up after it's rained or before the end of the, you know, financial year, we might be able to do that. Well, the pit we've got open at the Murdoch uh, farm is actually a, a loamy soil. Oh, a, great. Oh, a okay. Stony loamy. So it's a bit of a variation, but it'd be easy enough to then just with a spade, yeah. dig, out, dig out a bit of a, uh, a hole to look at the, uh, the sands and do some measurements there. Yeah, okay, great. Mm. Terrific. All right. Well, thanks for that. Well, I'll um, I'll work towards that um, because yeah, like I say, you guys can catch up. So you know, it's really it'd be really great if we could yeah get you all together. Yeah. So I'll just. In, um, sorry. sorry yeah. I mean, another option if people are planning to go to GRDC research updates. Oh, yes. That's third week of February. So February. You know, if people yep. are travelling in for something yeah. else. Uh, and a number of people are traveling in for something else uh, rather than having to do a separate trip that might mm. be um, more convenient but look I, i'm in in the hands of um, the uh, participants it's up it's it's yeah. for their convenience and what they would like to do and learn about yeah 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 definitely well yes absolutely so if there is you know if we find that half of the half of the participants are, are going to be in one spot at one time then we might as well make use of that opportunity for sure yeah we can hmm. sounds good okay uh so i'll just quickly because we've got we'll just um just quickly finish off on some of these things that i wanted to bring up 
and make sure that um, if you guys have got any questions about it. So um, the contributor agreements, so they are in the folder. Um, so please, if you haven't already, if you could get on to that. And like I said, I've got the collaborative resources. If you can't access that folder, can you please let me know? You might need a Gmail account to do that. So send me um, a Gmail email account uh, if you're having problems, because I'm going to upload all the resources into there. Um, and just a little reminder about the survey, which will help me deliver this program for you um, better. And that's always important for you to get the best out of it. So the Extension Oz Bootcamp, which I've invited you to attend is on the 11th, 12th and 24th. This is not compulsory. You don't need to attend, but it's an opportunity to hear about some online engagement, um, the latest in online engagement, networking with other communities of practices. I think there's about a dozen communities of practice in Extension Oz or uh, on different topics, but you'll hear about how they operate, um, what sort of information that they uh, share and how they share that information. So I think this is a space that's going to be ever evolving, even though we are moving back to, um, you know, some you guys are still doing some face to face, but I think there's opportunities, um, not just with this community as a practice, but for your organisation as a professional development opportunity to um, get upskilled in this area of um, online approaches and uh, networking opportunities. And there'll be a, a keynote speaker talking about the future of online digital environment and um, tools that you can use for extension and, and platforms. So, um, and it will be great because like I said, we'll hear about, hear from other communities of practice, which will help you guys to decide how you might like this community of practice to continue um, or evolve um, after the funding for this project uh, might wind up at the end of June next year. So part of uh, this project is to put together some sort of continuance plan or a uh, sort of a legacy um, explaining to the funders, you know, what we've achieved and, and what would be um proceed going forward after the funding finishes. So this will just give us that opportunity to talk through that and come up with some plans and ideas. Um, and like I said, hear from other COPs about how they're progressing. So um, like I said, it's not compulsory, but if you have got the time and availability, I'm sure it will be worth your while and it will help us um, come up with that continuance plan. So. If you have any other questions about it, please um, contact me. I'm more than happy to, um, to have a chat about it. I'll be attending, so you know I'll still be able to share that, that those things with you. But um, I think if we can get a few from each of the COPs to attend, then that will help. Um, if you do, I'll keep an eye on the registrations. I think at the moment they've got it starting at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I have talked to them about the fact that we are now in this ridiculous situation of five time zones across um, Australia. So I know that would be a very early start for you guys. So um, if there are a few who would like to attend, there is the opportunity to push it out to, you know, like a 10 o'clock start so that at least um, it's not so super early for you guys for, for logging in. So um, Can I just ask Felicity um, that I can't do the 24th. Um, but the 11th and the 12th, so they are separate events, aren't they? They're not the same thing. They're, they're separate, yeah. So there's three yeah. days worth of... Because it's a, um, in the past, this would have been held over one or two days um, coming together. So because mm -hmm. it's an online event, they're only holding it for sort of two to three hours over a three-day period, yeah. So, um, yeah, if you could come to a couple of days, then that would be fine. And I would, um, I will uh, organise a meeting in between the 12th and the 24th to catch up with everybody to, to, to um, you know, start that ball rolling with the um, planning stuff. So, again, I know it's probably a tricky time. And if, if it's not convenient for the majority who might be involved with harvesting um, and that sort of thing, then I can, we'll just postpone it until we, we meet face-to-face -face or um, 
or that sort of thing. So I probably could do the 24th given it starts at six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> if it does start, it's, it's right. Just be free by yeah, nine or whatever. work done. What's that? Well, be free. I, I think it's just that we've got our Christmas lunch that day. So, oh, yeah, I think it'll be well and truly over by the time our lunch starts. It'll be three o'clock your time. Yes. Yeah, that's right. You'll get half a day's work done. You'll get a nice early start. Uh, yeah, good. I'm glad someone's having Christmas parties because I'm pretty sure we won't be. But anyway, um, that's a whole other story. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, like I said, I'm happy to take some, some questions about that. And thanks, Peter. Um, now, the paired activity is really just an opportunity for you guys to drill down into a topic of interest. Um, like I said, I've got some feedback already about some who are looking at hydrophobic soils. Um, Nadine, have you um, progressed any more with anybody? Is, um... Yeah, I'm working with Brianna. Um, and we're looking at the herbicides. Um, so we've spoken to Richard some time ago. I haven't had much progress over seeding. Um, but um, Brianna's team can make podcasts. So that was our current line of thought. And we were hoping to yeah, interview someone from Murdoch um, and have a chat Yeah, about that. Great. No worries. Sounds like you've got your hands full. How's the new bub? <laughs> he's really good he's sitting very quietly um but the two-year-old is uh not so quiet <laughs> <laughs> oh you've done so well uh, hats off to you no doubt about you Nadine um well that sounds great thanks very much for for giving us an update on that um and I have been talking to Felicity Gilbert um and Natalie um will be catching up with Felicity as well um, and I'll try and catch up with the other guys and find out what they're up to so that um, I guess we, we know, yeah, what's happening. So, um, so I guess, sorry, Nadine, I didn't mean to cut you up. So the herbicides is in regards to, um, or if Brianna wants to, to um, answer, in regards to um, uh, herbicide continuancy, is that right? Like um, persistence, sorry. Yeah, so it was just on that project that Murdoch had coming through on the herbicide residuals in the soil, I think it was, from memory. I haven't had a chance to look at it lately, That's but um, we thought it'd be a good podcast to go out with our West Midlands group paddock chat podcast as well, and it's a great way for growers to have a look at it and yeah, learn about excellent. it as it comes through. Yeah, fantastic. No, that sounds great. Okay. So, you. We, um, Nadine and Brianna, were you waiting on anything from me? Anything that I promised to do that I've forgotten about? No, uh, no, I, I don't. don't. don't think, um, yeah, okay, good. I just suddenly had a guilty moment. <laughs> <laughs> we once we have a Brianna and I have a chat about what we want the podcast to look like. Um, we'd like to interview someone. So whether it's yourself or I think you mentioned there was a PhD student um, yes, yes. working she, on it. Yeah, no, Pion's uh, underway and she has material in the glass house and um, uh, yeah, she'll be rolling through with her glass house experiments for a few months at least. Yeah. Do you recommend that we contact her and ask her if she would like to be involved? Uh, I'll just ask her. I'm sure I'm sure she would and um, her, her English is pretty good she's uh, from Myanmar but she's um, um, you know uh, I'm sure she'd be very happy to uh, contribute and, and help out just need to uh, clarify what what it is that you'd like her to contribute yeah yeah we'll have a think about that maybe we could ask her a little bit about Myanmar as well could be interesting mm. side note to the podcast I'd like to know more yeah well, um, she's, as part of her PhD, is going to go back home when she's allowed to yeah. and uh, just do a bit of surveying and assessment to see um, is herbicide persistence and herbicide residues already emerging as an issue in Myanmar or uh, not yet. Right. 
Okay, thanks guys, that's, that's terrific. Um, and just the final thing, just a reminder that the Soil CRC um, conference is still planned to go ahead at the end of March. So um, just keep that in your diaries for the last, or in your calendars for the last week in March and I'll confirm those dates um, going forward. So hopefully old mate will let you out so you can get to Adelaide for that. Um, and we'll also still plan for, um, to catch up for the Soil Science Australia Conference in June, at the end of June um, in Cairns. So we're still planning on that because we imagine we'll still have some funds available to support that. Um, I think it's just a fantastic opportunity um, for you guys to, uh, um, you know, listen to some awesome um presenters and network with the best soil scientists um, in Australia and New Zealand, um, possibly overseas. So um, yeah, I think I'm still really keen to, to support that um, opportunity uh, for you guys. Because yeah, I think it'll just be a really great way to um, finish off uh, our work as well. So uh, let's hope. I mean, would it be useful to um, offer a, a poster just describing the community of practice. And I mean, it doesn't have to be just WA, but uh, I think it'd be a, something uh, a bit interesting and uh, different and, um, and um, an opportunity to reflect yep. on what's been learned and also to share that with the, the broader soils community. Yeah, 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 for sure. So we, um, we did, uh, Michael had sent an, an email to the um, to the organisers, um, and they were really keen to have us along. So we'll definitely uh, be in conversation with them about um, being able to, yeah, have some involvement one way or another. So mm -hmm. thanks, Richard. We'd, um, that'd be great. That'd be, that'd be really good. Hmm. Also, I think on uh, World Soils Day, uh, there's an activity out at Muresca Soils activity, or I think Regen Ag. Yeah. is uh, sort of running it, but it will have some soil components. So yeah. I don't have the details at hand, but it's either, it'll either be on the 4th, which is the Friday, or the 5th, which is the actual World Soils Day. Um, yes, the 5th. Um, is, that, is that a Saturday this year, is it? Yes. Yeah, that'd be great to um, share those opportunities, Richard, if you, yeah, if there's anything popping up. Mm -hmm. um, and it might be an opportunity to get together um, at that time if, if people are available too. So just play that one by ear. That sounds good. Um, okay, so that's all I had. If there's, um, yeah, any last questions from me or any clarification or anything, please fire away and once again I really appreciate you guys taking the time and and um, you've you've um, had a really great opportunity to catch up with Richard as well so um, yeah look I was just going to mention one thing um, from that one for field day I don't know if Richard if you remember but as we were standing in that pit I had my video camera and I didn't record you because you were standing right in front of me and it would have been I might have been recording up your nose almost <laughs> But I did record Steve Davies in the pit um, without his permission. Um, but I have forwarded on to Wayne Parker, who works with him. But, um, yeah, look, I just it probably is a – I haven't even looked at it myself. I've just opened it up now. It's here. I can share you. I can share it for half a minute if you just want to have a quick look. But it might be something worth mm. um, doing or sharing or something like that for a second. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'll just – I think this will play. See what happens. Yep, something's starting. Yeah. It was a very... We just can't hear the sound, but that's okay. I think when you do sharing of a video, um, oh, all right. something about turning the sound on or something, but um, that looks pretty cool. That looks, um, yeah. Very useful. Yeah, it was a very... Um, it was a beautiful day, but yeah, the, as you can see, the shadows were sort of cast up against the wall, so it was a bit hard to, to see. But anyway, yeah, oh, well. got that. We can still see, like he's, he's clearly put some dye in or something like that, so mm. you can clearly see that, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, well, if he's happy for you to share that, then um, I'd be happy to, yeah, post it somewhere. Or if you just want to, um, yeah, what would you have to do? Stick it on Vimeo or something like that? Yeah, I could, I could, I could look back at it. Yeah, and if it's his permission, we could maybe put it on YouTube or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Or just share the video, whatever, whatever you like. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, that looks great. Okay. All right. Well, um, thanks again, guys, and um, appreciate your time and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe and um, we'll be in touch um, going forward. So thanks very much. Okay. All right, thank, thank you. you. See you later, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Peter.